So let's talk a little bit about the lost situation. Sure, you, sure. There, there have certainly been much written about this. You know, what was the project you were brought in to pitch on Lost? Explain how your association began. Um, my association was I had a deal with a guy named Ted Gold who was at Spelling at the time. And he called me and said that ABC and Lloyd Braun wanted to do essentially a version of the movie Castaway. Um, and that the big caveat was that they wanted it to be sort of hyper real. They wanted to see, you know, it was about a bunch of people lost on an island and what would it be like to start over again? And specifically, what kind of society would you choose, right? Would you choose to do it the way we do it now or would you choose to sort of start over and do something totally different? Um, so I was sort of brought in. So I went in and I put together a pitch uh, about a plane that went down between, I believe it was Sydney and, and San Francisco or, or Chicago, I forget what it was. And um, and they were they got ended up on this island, and then the, basically the pilot tracked the first week they were on the island, um, and then the realization that essentially no one was looking for them and they were lost. Uh, the show is called Nowhere in My Mind, not Nowhere in My Mind, but Nowhere, nowhere. comma in my mind. Cool, and and they responded well to this. Pitch. They bought in the room, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I started working on that, and they hooked me up with National Geographic. As a way of making sure that I had that 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 my facts were right, that I picked, you know, that I you know I keep joking that I was not allowed to create a bug that I couldn't justify in the South Pacific. Um, so so yeah, they were very in on this idea of what would it be like to be lost and and uh, how would society recreate itself and to take it extremely seriously. Yeah yeah oh yeah it was it it was all uh, it, it's funny um, there, there there are lots of like threads between what I wrote what was in the original script that J.J. and Damon did that never made it to film. But there was, you know, the, the big moment in both my script and their script that n never made it was this character who was the, the rock, right? The person you knew would help you survive. Um, in my character, it was this former uh, Arv Army or Navy guy, you know, retired, who was their leader and then died in the middle of the script. Uh, fell off a cliff. Uh, I had originally had him die in a in a shark attack, and they were like, "No, no, no, that's too out there." No sharks. No, no sharks, right? Um, and I know that um, in Damon and JD's first script, uh, what's his face, um, the lead, Jack, Jack died in the middle of the pilot as well. Um, so it was an interesting it was an interesting parallel that there were a bunch of instincts that that sort of held through to both of them, um, um, and I'm sure had we cast it, um, uh, my version. That that you'd have gotten this great actor for the part of the of the retired army guy, and then we'd be like, all right, you can't kill him off. So um, anyway, so uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that, other than to say, um, when the transition was made from me to them, clearly the decision was made that that the reality part was not the most important part, and that that the soap was going to be helped a lot by being able to go wherever you wanted to go. And, and would you have written a version of the show that was as, as out there as, as theirs was? If they had come in and said, hey, you know, we want something more mystical or something more sci-fi. I don't know. I mean, that's a question. I mean, certainly my background, um, you know, as a kid, I read a lot of Stephen King and a lot of, uh, of sci-fi. So I've got that background. And if unshackled in that way, you know, I certainly, would have done, I certainly wouldn't have done the show that exists. That's, that is the complete purview of, the, of Damon and J.J. and Carlton and all those guys. Um, but certainly would have been helped by the the ability to to walk away from reality a little bit. Uh, but but I, I say that only in that um, I certainly loved the version I was pursuing. I certainly loved the Lord of the Flies version of the thing. Um, and whether it would have worked or not, you never know. It, was, it would have worked differently if it would have worked. And then uh, there's a process involved in which it's determined that you get credit as a co-creator. Is, is there a succinct way to even explain how WGA arbitration works? Um, the succinct way, and the lovely thing is that, that, that one of the great things the Guild does is they sort of take over the process, which is all I ever had to do on that process was to sort of stand up and say, hey, I'd like to arbitrate. Uh, actually, I didn't even have to say that. They, they, when they say three names on the script... Uh, um, then the arbitration is natural. The only thing I had to do was basically write a statement and so on and so forth, and the guild takes, takes, takes the rest of it. So what they do is they look at, are the characters similar? Is the dialogue similar? Is the setup is really the big one? Is the, is the structural conceit, conceit similar? And then they make a determination as to who gets credit and how it all falls out. So it's a very, you know, uh, I don't want to say neutral process. 
Yeah, the the um, the I've I've been on the other side. I've I have worked uh, for the guild, uh, looking at people's. Uh, I've I've done the other half. I've been an arbitrator, and you don't know what the people who, who you don't know who you're reading. You don't know who was the first writer, who was the second writer. You just sort of take a look at the stuff. So it's fairly neutral. And I think one of the things the guild does pretty well is protect the original writers. Um, 